everybody. Uh, welcome to the Humanities in STEM elevator pitch number four of the seventh Polygents Symposium of Rising Scholars. My name is Anthony Viverka. I am the head of mentor recruitment here at Polygents. So I've worked with a number of the mentors that are uh, the mentors for the students in this particular call. Uh, but I appreciate you all attending today. The goal of this symposium is to create and showcase the hard work of all of our Polygen scholars, all of whom have tirelessly worked on their projects over the past couple of months. We have seven students presenting on a variety of topics today. A fellow member of our Polygen's team will be scoring each student's presentation, which will help us determine prize winners after the event. Please type any questions and answers. Uh, please type anything in the Q&A if you have any questions for each speaker. We'll have time at the end of the session for the speakers to answer your questions. Today's speakers are Krishna Karthikeya Chamudapati, Rohil Watwe, Anton Lole, Claire Wu, Manya Sinha, Kyle Wynn, and Talia Zafari. That's the order of our presentations. So I'm going to turn it over to Krishna to start us off. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share my screen here for a second. Is that is that visible to you? Oh. Yep, we can see it. All right. So, um, hey everyone. My name is Krishna Chamadapati. I'm a high school. I'm a senior in high school, and my polygens project revolves around biodiesel harvested from microalgae. It speaks about the ways in which an alternative type of fuel can be derived from microalgae and investigates the aspects of harvesting biodiesel. So what is microalgae? Well, it's a type of organism that is unicellular, meaning it's just one cell, and it's a photosynthetic organism. Therefore, it converts sunlight and carbon dioxide into oxygen and energy for its use. During their life cycle, a large amount of lipids, which are fats, accumulate inside of them biodiesel is created by extracting that fat and converting it into a usable fuel source. This biofuel is known as an alternative fuel source. It serves as an alternative to fossil fuels. You may ask, why does any of this even matter? Well, it should be important to note that fossil fuels are a very unsustainable source of fuel. Burning fossil fuels entails the use of a scarce resource that will one day become depleted. Furthermore, the burning of fossil fuels produces emissions that are responsible for 65% of the excess mortality rate caused by air pollution. The need to find an alternative fuel source is high. Moreover, it should be put into perspective that the human population is increasing rapidly. The greater the population and the greater the technological advances of humans, the greater the need for a sustainable fuel source. Microalgae can be harvested in a multitude of ways in order to yield biodiesel. The most common and most cost-effective way is by using a specific setup known as an open pond paddle wheel raceway style system. And uh, the layout can be seen here with this sort of racetrack layout and is characterized by a paddle wheel that keeps the medium circulating. The microalgae is then separated into its biomass and lipid content to finally obtain biodiesel. However, there exists some limitations to the growth of microalgae in these systems as environmental factors, including pH levels, light intensity, and temperature all affect the efficiency with which the microalgae can be harvested. To conclude, research into these factors and how to address them allows for a better understanding of the possible avenues microalgae can provide as an alternative fuel source. Thanks so much, Krishna. That was awesome. Um, I appreciate the, the presentation and starting us off on a really positive note here. Um, in the interest of time, as I said, we're going to hold the Q&A till the end. Um, so we're going to go over to Rohel Watway for our second presentation. Yeah, let me just share my screen a little quickly. Can you all see that? Yep, we're good. All right. 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rohil Walwit, and this is my presentation on music and the mind, how music therapy has an effect on Alzheimer's patients. The main question I was trying to explore in this research was how to alleviate Alzheimer's symptoms in a novel way. So first, what started it all? What prompted me to explore such a unique topic? Firstly, my background in music. I started playing piano at the age of five, and I'm also an all-state viola player. Next, various amounts of medical experience. I've had plenty of medical experiences from volunteering at my local ER to shadowing different neurologists. Finally, current events such as the COVID-19 pandemic. Due to COVID, many nursing homes have been struggling to bounce back, and I have felt the need to help out. Next, what did I exactly do? First, I went to multiple nursing homes across the community. I then played piano using a set repertoire for the residents. Using cloud-based surveys, I was able to take diagnostics regarding their mood, overall health, and other relevant information, such as age and gender. After multiple trials, I was able to compile all of this into a research paper. Now, what exactly were the findings? Overall, the study was a massive success with patients reporting feeling less stressed, having a more positive mood and improvements in short-term memory. Over 95% of patients reported improvements after just four sessions of music therapy. Finally, how does this apply to the real world? Why should you care? We live in a world where life expectancy has been going up steadily since the 80s. The number of people with Alzheimer's is also increasing at a drastic pace. Alzheimer's is the number one neurodegenerative disease in the US. Finding a way to prevent the onset or even finding a cure will be crucial for an aging population. Currently, there is no absolute cure for Alzheimer's and music therapy could be an innovative solution. Thank you everyone so much for listening and I hope you all will agree that this presentation on Alzheimer's will be hard to forget. Thank you, Rahul. Appreciate that. Uh, love what you're doing here in terms of helping our aging population. Uh, I appreciate the time. I'm going to pass it over to Anton Lole for their presentation next. Uh, I'm seeming to uh, have some technical difficulties. Would it be possible for me to go later? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank no you. problem. Let me know if you need any help and uh, we'll get that squared away. So um, moving on to our next presenter, uh, Claire Wu, I'll be happy to uh, pass that over to her now. Sure. Um, could you see my screen? Yes, we can. Hello everyone, my name is Claire Wu and my pitch is centered on my research paper, Orientalism and Fetishization, the Societal and Self-Perception of Asian American Women. My primary question was, how has the treatment of Asian women throughout American history shaped societal and self-perception of Asian women? Since the COVID-19 pandemic, hate crimes against Asian Americans have skyrocketed to an all-time high. To understand some of the ideology behind this tragic occurrence, my research paper discusses America's deep history of anti-Asian sentiments and the extent to which these ideologies have specifically influenced society's perception of Asian women in a modern context. <clears throat> Sorry. I explored immigration legislation like the Page Act of 1875 and the War Bread Act of 1945, which revealed the United States bias against Asian women, specifically women. Through extensive research of firsthand accounts and historical data, I was able to narrow down three concepts that influence Western perception of the East. Orientalism, fetishization, and ornamentalism. Orientalism is defined as a created body of theory and practice, which constructs images of the East to appeal to the West. This concept can be seen in Hollywood, with many female Asian characters falling into the dragon lady or madam butterfly roles. Fetishization is subjectification of individuals whose real or fantasized presence is necessary for sexual gratification. 
Ornamentalism stems from Orientalism, where the Asian body and culture become synonymous with the traditional ornaments that are highly coveted by the West. There are evidently modern consequences to Asian fetishization. Just over a year ago, workers of Asian descent at a spa in Atlanta, Georgia, were murdered by a gunman who viewed them as sexual temptations. I live in the state of California, and despite being one of the most diverse and accepting states in the US, the state has seen a 177.5% increase in Asian hate crimes from 2020 to 2021. Internationally, sex tourism is one of the major concerns regarding Asian women. Developing countries in Asia have a booming sex tourism industry marketed towards Western men, trafficking thousands of local children and adults, effectively trapping them in cycles of poverty. In conclusion, anti-Asian rhetoric from the past continues to bleed into the present. However, we are beginning to see gradual improvements with better Asian representation in media, as well as advances in politics and sports. I believe the topic my research paper analyzes is vital to growth, understanding, and bridging cultural divides. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Claire. I really do appreciate it. Um, definitely, uh, I can see the differences over the past couple of years. So uh, I definitely appreciate you doing uh, this type of research for your project. Uh, I'm going to pass it over now to Anton to uh, take on the, the next um, role. All right, let me just share my screen. Can everyone see that? Uh, not yet. All right. One second, I'm getting an error code. I'm just gonna... No problem. Yeah, and uh, everyone's been... Um, tirelessly working on these projects and uh, we do appreciate all the time. I know sometimes with Zoom, there are some slight technical difficulties as a whole, um, but uh, again, right, um, spending 10 sessions working on all of this is uh, amazing for everyone. So I do uh, absolutely uh, appreciate the the time as a, as a whole. Uh, we do see some very inventive projects and creative projects, as you all can see. Um, but uh, looks like Anton is still uh, looking to rectify some of the technical difficulties. Uh, so what I will do is, Mania, are you uh, ready to go here? And I can pass it on. Yeah, I'm ready. Perfect. I'll send it over to you and I'll jump off camera. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we are good. <laughs> so hi, my name is Melania, and today I'm going to be presenting my literature review paper on the relationship between socioeconomic status, also known as SES, anxiety, and the amygdala. Okay, so why did I choose this topic? Within the adolescent population, 31.9% are expected to experience a form of an anxiety disorder. Around 19.1% of US adults were estimated to have, any, have had any anxiety disorder in the past year. Aside from beloved statistics, I chose this topic specifically because of the increase in the prevalence of this anxiety and depression um, due to the pandemic. During times like these, mental health has become an extremely to crucial topic to address and that's why I ended up choosing this topic. So what is the relationship between socioeconomic status and anxiety? Lower SES was found to have a strong association with trait anxiety, and trait anxiety refers to a stable aspect of one's personality encompassing feelings of anxiety that are countless and uh, present in countless situations. Children and adolescents with low SES are two to three more times more likely to develop mental health problems than peers with high SES. And poverty at the 14-year-old age mark was found to be the greatest predictor of adolescent and young adult anxiety. The more frequently a child experiences poverty, the higher the possibility of them being anxious at ages 14 and 21. What is the relationship between SES, the amygdala, and anxiety? 
Lower parental education was associated with higher rates of anxiety among individuals and lower family income and parental education were significantly, significantly associated with smaller amygdala volume in adolescents, but not significantly, significantly associated with amygdala volume at younger ages. And finally, the conclusion. What are the key takeaways from the research that I did? Number one, low socioeconomic status is correlated with an increased risk for anxiety disorders. Number two, there is a relationship between significant exposure to poverty during adolescence and amygdala, amygdala structure. And number three, proper health and mental health care resources for underprivileged individuals are crucial. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much for that presentation, Rania. Um, definitely, uh, there's a theme here with some of our neuroscience research. So um, that's amazing to hear uh, on a multiple different fronts. Uh, I'm going to go pass it over to Kyle now for his presentation. Uh, thank you. Um, let me share my screen quickly. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Okay, I'll get started. 23%. That's how many children under the age of 18 Pew Research Center records that live on, with one parent and know their adults. Personally, I wasn't given the luxury of two parents growing up without a father, but the lessons I've learned from my mom are as adequate as any two parent family. She taught me no matter how little we have, we contribute tenfold to the world. This led me with no hesitation in deciding the course of approach for this project to be focused on researching economic and legislative solutions to combating poverty in a state that both has the highest rates of single parenthood and poverty, Alabama. Through the observation of different sources, um, such as reviewing reports by civic engineers on the state's infrastructure, University of, Alabama, University of Alabama's analytical papers on poverty rates, and the 2022 Alabama budget report, some solutions highlighted in this paper can be helped to decrease poverty rates in the state. This begins with supporting the growth of urban industrial cities such as Tuscaloosa and the development of rural impoverished areas, such specifically the Black Belt region. Next, making way for specific growing industries, such as the aerospace industry through tax abatements and subsidies. And finally, adopting a proportional tax rate structure rather than the current regressive tax rate structure the, the state currently adopts. This, leads, this would lead to increases in job opportunities and access to resources that many single pa fa family parents originally didn't have access to. Poverty is a clear concern around the country. The divide between the rich and the increasing poor ceased to stop between because of a limbo for policymakers to take effect effective initiatives upon this issue. However, the possible solutions provided in this paper will give a glimpse for states in these surrounding areas to adopt similar strategies to combating poverty. Furthermore, it is to ensure that I pay tenfold to the contributions to the 23% this generation and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Yes, this is definitely something that um, we are absolutely needing to be looking further into. So I absolutely uh, appreciate that that research that you've done here. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Talia now uh, for her presentation. Okay. Um, are you viewing my screen? Yep, we're good to go. Okay, perfect. Hello, everyone. My name is Talia Zafari. I'm a junior at Marlboro School, and my polydense project is centered around deliberative democracy. Growing up and learning about democracy in my history classes has always been the same. I've always been taught that democracy means a government by the people, for the people, and that all people are socially equal. If democracy is for the people, why is it that whenever I read the news, I see many citizens in our democracy arguing over the same topics over and over again? This confounded me and I was in search of a solution. Then I came across deliberative democracy, 
a form of democracy in which discussion and deliberation occur before any political decisions are made. As I came across this seemingly magical concept, I thought if only students were able to learn about deliberative democracy at a young age, then maybe the political world could be less polarizing. That's when I decided I would take it into my own hands and teach students about it. Guided by my Polygen's mentor, I wrote a children's book called Bella, Ali, and Maya's Discovery of Deliberative Democracy, lost at the airport. In my book, the three protagonists are left behind their families in the airport, and they go through obstacles and adventures in an attempt to fix the situation. In the process, they make some rash decisions, then progress to making wise decisions that they all agree upon. On the left is the cover of the book, and on the right is when the three characters meet. The following slides are just a few snippets that highlight a few ways that the characters come across deliberative democracy. Throughout the book, Bella, Ali, and Maya are exposed to concepts such as equal representation, voting with representation, and deliberation through everyday examples as they are lost at the airport. In this scene, the characters are learning about equal representation. When two of them disagree about how they should get their dinner and one stayed silent, not vo voicing her opinion. After many other adventures here, the characters face their last obstacle in which they learn how to effectively deliberate and then vote on how they should contact their parents. It was important to me for the characters to have the knowledge of these key concepts in order for the reader to be able to understand deliberative democracy which is revealed at the end in a flash forward. In the flash forward, Bella is president and she realizes that when she was younger, lost at the airport, she was utilizing deliberative democracy. She also shares that she is using deliberative democracy as president in her everyday political decisions to make the world a better place. It was important to me to reach a young audience through this book so that they grew up with the understanding that collaborating and discussing with people who may not always have the same beliefs as you is crucial in solving problems and making choices effectively. By educating students on deliberative democracy, it is my hope that I'm doing my part in making the world less divided. Thank you. Thank you, Talia, I appreciate it. I, uh, yeah, definitely, I can imagine that uh, making this as accessible as possible was one of the main goals of yours, and we absolutely appreciate that. I'm going to actually take over here in terms of presenting for Anton, and then after Anton does present, we will uh, be able to open the floor for uh, any Q&A that we have at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, just to make sure, and then let me know what um, when you want me to send to the next particular slide. Uh, let me just spotlight you really quickly. One second. Okay. There we go. And I will. All right. Let's see. And I'll remove my video. All Good right, job. my perfect. All right, um, sorry for the technical difficulties, but now we can start. So my name is Anton, I'm a junior in high school, and my presentation is on the effects of low-level laser therapy on skeletal muscle and uh, athletic performance. So next slide. So in today's hyper-competitive world, people will do whatever it takes to get an edge over their competition. And this is especially true in the world of athletics. Uh, next slide. Uh, technology and training has been optimized to the most minute details and athletes have been using uh, illicit substances just to get uh, better results than their competitors. But what if there's a cost-effective and non-invasive way to increase performance uh, for every single athlete on the globe? Next slide. This is where low-level laser therapy comes in. Next slide. Low-level laser therapy, or photobiomodulation, as it's also called, is using cold, low-powered lasers at a wavelength of 650 nanometers to 800 na 850 nanometers to increase performance and help with... Uh, rest and uh, 
increasing general performance. Next slide. The main, like the main, uh, mainly researched parts of low-level laser therapy are on the benefits of the integumentary system and benefits to deep tissue, such as improving skin and hair quality and helping with arthritis. But you may be asking, how, do, how does this help with athletics? Next slide. Next. There's been some preliminary studies on the ergogenic benefits of low-level laser therapy, such as these two studies that show significant increases in uh, muscle strength after applying low-level laser therapy uh, intertwined with a workout routine. Study on the left showed a 55% increase in somebody's leg press compared to 25% without the low-level laser therapy. And the right study shows a decrease in the average time for elite rugby players on their sprints. Next slide. Now, the extent to the benefits of low-level laser therapy is highly uh, debated, especially when it comes to muscle fatigue. And these two studies show opposing viewpoints on how low-level laser therapy can help with muscle fatigue. Next slide. But there is a future of low-level laser therapy in athletics. The picture below is of the San, Francisco's 49, the San Francisco 49ers. They have their own red light recovery room that they have claimed has helped their players' performance. Next slide. So conclusion, low-level laser therapy is a brand new piece of athletic technology that uh, is just starting to see some usage in the elite athletic world. And it could have some significant benefits and significant uses. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Anton. <clears throat> I actually have a juve red light therapy sitting next to my desk for my knees. So um, oh, wow. absolutely familiar with uh, this. Uh, my girlfriend is uh, used some of your references as well. So I definitely have a uh, personal uh, interest in, in this type of study. Um, but thanks so much for all of our presenters. I wanted to uh, kind of open this up for Q and A. Um, so what we'll do is I want to kind of go around the room so we can start in the order that everybody presented in terms of what was kind of the hardest thing about your particular research um, that you saw in terms of obstacles over the course of the particular project that you were working on. Uh, so I can start and ask Krishna, um, what is the hardest part about your research that you've completed? Sure. So during my research process, it was a little difficult to find, you know, a significant amount of research on this topic only because biodiesel is significantly less efficient than fossil fuels, right? So a lot of people are opting for fossil fuels because you can get much more energy from fossil fuels, whereas, you know, it's still unsustainable, but there's not as much research being done into the field to be able to find enough, um, you know, ample evidence that's going to allow me to feel like, okay, this could be something, right? Like we're heading in the right direction. Not that biodiesel is not going to be a viable option. It's just there needs to be more research done and more development done to be able to find the best way to maximize, um, you know, how much fuel we can get out of it. So I think that might have been the hardest thing for me in my process. Yeah, absolutely. And then, I mean, I was going to ask this question for everybody later, but I can ask it now. So uh, what is the the next step, right? Are you planning on continuing with this research due to the lack of current available research to contribute to those findings? Yeah. So what I'm interested in studying uh, in my college education is environmental engineering. And as an environmental engineer, I would like to research, you know, the different factors that come into play. If you recall, I briefly mentioned environmental factors having an effect. So finding out how those can be moderated or even adjusted to our benefit to be more efficient, even, you know, that kind of study would be um, something I'd be very interested in doing. So, Awesome. Awesome. That's great to hear. Um, and then I'll pass it over to Raul to see um, what was the hardest thing about their presentation or project rather. 
Yeah, so definitely there were, I definitely hit a couple of setbacks, definitely due to COVID, like the main bulk of my research, it was me going out to different like nursing homes, kind of playing piano, doing these studies in person, because it's really hard to do these things virtually. So uh, that was definitely one of my biggest setbacks just because of COVID, half of the nursing homes would be shut down, they wouldn't be accepting visitors, things like that. So that was just kind of a setback, but yeah. That, I would definitely say that was the biggest setback. Awesome. And then how did you kind of account for that being able to do as much as you possibly could? Was it just sheer volume of outreach or? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, at some points I was emailing like 10, 15 nursing homes. Like I've driven like one, one and a half, even two hours to try to get to some of these places that are like still accepting uh, visitors, things like that. So, yeah. Absolutely. No, I, I can definitely see that a lot of legwork on your end. Um, and that's awesome that you're able to do that. I'm sure it wasn't the easiest thing and the coordination and the planning there was uh, was difficult, but I'm glad you're able to get the the necessary information you needed to be successful in your, in your project. Yeah. Um, and then I'll pass it over to Claire to kind of hear about her um, hardest part of the project. Um, I think the hardest part of the project for me was because this project was um, somewhat personal to myself. And um, at times, I think going through sources and, you know, reading these events in history kind of made me a little sad and depressed. Um, and it's, I had to research very heavy topics um, that, you know, aren't talked about much in academia. And um, I think that that was something that impacted me while I was writing it because it put a lot of things into a new and different perspective for me. And I think it kind of hit home sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. I can totally imagine how that was uh, that was tough there, um, but it's definitely part of the reason why uh, Polygents does exist. So you all have an avenue where you otherwise wouldn't necessarily have that avenue in academia or in the confines of that particular curriculum of which you're uh, kind of uh, put into for the respective high schools that you're all at. So uh, I'm really glad that you were able to kind of pursue this and work with a mentor um, that was able to uh, work with you as as best as possible, despite the the heaviness and the personal um, investment that you had on this particular topic. Um, so absolutely appreciate that um, going through and hope that it does. Um, you do continue to do that. And this does get added more and more to those levels of academia, whether that be in high school, college, masters, or PhD programs, and just in general being talked about more um, if possible. Uh, I will pass it over to Mania for, uh, to learn a little bit the hardest part of hers. Uh, so for me, I guess finding the research papers that I sort of went over to write my um, literature review paper, was sort of hard at the beginning. It took like a few weeks to finalize all the papers that I had chosen. And I had to dig quite a bit for um thing, like papers that matched like what I was looking for. And when I was reading them, a lot of these things that uh, were uh, things that I saw, I've seen in real life because I've done a lot of volunteering at homeless shelters. And I like, I can definitely see the impact that mental disorders has um, on underprivileged children and it, it was just like sad because it's it's not everyone gets the same um, privileges in life and it, it, you can truly see the impact of socioeconomic status on um, their learning capabilities and everything and I guess my research sort of opened up my eyes to how crucial those mental health resources are for those children. Yeah, that's great. I mean, um, amazing. There's a uh, organization in DC that I've been a part of. It's called Playtime. Um, basically, you go once a week or once every couple of weeks to play with the children who are suffering from homelessness. And there's kind of different types of disparities, right? So a couple of years back, there was a central um, homeless shelter um, that then got decentralized. But in the interim right that large homeless shelter that could house probably a thousand people they didn't sufficiently build the other and auxiliary homeless shelter so there was a lot of 
overflow. Um, there's two particular hotels that those individuals are housed in for the time being, but um, like being in a house or something, like you don't, you're not affected by little signs or things that might be uh, a little bit more egregious for their development, such as right in every hotel, it's a no running sign, right? So that's almost like a no play zone, if you will, right? So those seemingly innocuous things can affect those individuals at, on a larger scale, right? And you're in a hotel room, potentially with one family or two families, you have a hot plate. So you're required to usually order out to some extent, probably not the healthiest food. So um, absolutely understand um, your your mindset there. And I can imagine that that was pretty tough because um, just like um, uh, some of the other issues that we were trying to find studies on it, or it's not necessarily talked about as Claire uh, had mentioned, that's another another piece to the to the puzzle here. Awesome. And I will uh, send it over to Kyle um, to talk a little bit about the hardest part of his project. Um, yeah, the hardest part of my project was kind of looking through um, kind of government papers because there, there's like a few paper sources I look, which I also talked about in my presentation, like the budget papers, like it's like a whole spreadsheet of like, like a bunch of like allocation of funds towards different agencies in the state of Alabama and kind of um, just a lot of like reading a lot of like sections and a lot of legislation. And um, when it comes to like tax, um, tax rip, um, uh, abatement, sorry, tax abatements and kind of government subsidies. And um, besides that, also kind of the hardest part was um, just some uh, just kind of writing the whole process, learning about different topics like marginal tax rates, progressive, proportional, and regressive tax rates, and learning about all these different concepts. But in the end, it was pretty beneficial and kind of I learned a lot from this project, not just presenting. That's great to hear. Yeah. And I mean, um, the issue with tax is that those laws can change consistently, right? Like it's not necessarily something that you can do a stratified sample of one specific background or tax abatement or uh, regressive or progressive tax, tax rates over say 35, 40 years that gets increasingly smaller as time passes because of the reforms and the changes inconsistently um, for state versus local versus federal. Um, and they're always changing. Uh, that's why they have uh, TurboTax for us right now, even though that that is pretty difficult in general, trying to understand all the different things that are changing year over year. Um, so absolutely love what uh, everyone has said here and um, really appreciate you doing this particular research because, again, it's not um, something that is going to be um, easy to do on a linear level. You have to layer it consistently um, to kind of garner that conclusion yeah thank you and uh, i'll pass it over to anton for um the uh, or sorry to uh talia sorry i'll pass over to talia sorry um and then um we'll get to anton last hi so um i think the more difficult part of this project was figuring out how I would explain the more complex idea of deliberative democracy to such a young audience and analyzing what background knowledge and information that they would need. So in order to do this, I had to get feedback from any young students and look into the curriculum of elementary schools to see what they learn. Um, and it was also a challenge to make the concept understandable and attainable, which is why I use that everyday adventures to make it seem like a normal children's book, but then there's this deeper layer um, that reveals an academic element. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that this is um, taking into consideration uh, what we just uh, talked about with regards to the education and developmental levels, right? So you had to not only look at the curriculum of elementary schools, but then figure out of those particular elementary schools, what actual, what is the real level of education for those particular individuals. So um, 
even making it more accessible uh, as you're moving forward because you want this specific topic to be able to be absorbed by as many individuals as possible, uh, but while it's still being something relevant to them in their everyday lives, I'm sure was um, kind of a challenge throughout. And do you need to make it a little bit lower proficiency so that the uh, accept, uh, the the access increases? And then at what point do you draw that line to make it available to those that might be in fourth or fifth grade, but might be at a first or second grade understanding level um, to find that dichotomy there, I, I think is um, really powerful. Uh, and then I will finally pass it over to Anton. All right. So for me, the most difficult part was um, actually in the beginning of the project, uh, my mentor and I were actually doing a real experiment. So we were setting up like a procedure list and uh, hoping to actually perform an experiment to measure if there was actually an athletic benefit to using low level laser therapy. But uh, about three quarters of the way through, uh, school started, so couldn't get any uh, participants. And we had to switch to a review paper, which was pretty difficult. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, with that, do you, and I guess to get this one in, in next steps for you, since it kind of aligns, do you plan on pursuing this additional research now that school has been in session for a little bit and working to try to re-vamp or re-up that original intention in the future? Uh, yeah, at school, um, I've found my, uh, I guess, uh, another mentor at school who's trying to help me do it uh, through the school year. And hopefully I'm gonna have it done by January and see if my, yeah, finish my own research. Awesome, awesome, that's, that's great to hear. Um, so we heard a little bit from Krishna and a little bit of Anton at, as of their next steps, but would love to turn it over to some of our other presenters. Um, if I can call on Royal to uh, talk about your next steps in uh, this discovery. Yeah, for sure. So I've submitted my paper to a couple of different like research journals. And so I'm just waiting for publishing. And then even in college and like future education, I really hope to kind of explore this more. Uh, there's definitely been a decent increase in kind of this link between music and then more like medicine. So kind of the healthcare field. And so a lot of universities now offer courses regarding this. So I, I really want to explore it more uh, in my later education as well. That's wonderful. Yeah. And I mean, uh, there is increasing interest, at least from our polygen students about the intersection between neuroscience and music theory, music therapy, things along those lines. So we do see um, you're not alone. Uh, I can promise yeah. you that, especially over the last couple of months. Um, these students are um, working to, they oftentimes have a music background or an interest in particular music or whatever type of uh, media that could help those individuals on uh, different spectrums throughout neuroscience. Uh, and I think that this uh, research is really just getting started about, and there's really anywhere to go. It's limitless, mm -hmm. which I think is, yeah. is pretty awesome. And mm -hmm. then um, I, can, uh, I can pass it over to Claire for uh, her next steps. Um, I think my next steps are really um, just trying to publish as well. Um, I've also submitted my work to a lot of student journals, and so I'm also waiting on a reply back. Um, but additionally from that, in college, I also want to study something similar, which is um, close to what I was researching. Um, I also want to go into American history and American studies, um, and then maybe for law or public policy, things like that. So that one day I could make rules and regulations and um, things that can actually help Asian American women. And I think that would be just my next step. Awesome, that's, uh, that's great to hear. And then this is, there's obviously 
a need for this due to the lack of historical accuracy that we're necessarily learning. So just bringing it up to the forefront of things and testimonials and, and, and real life examples from individuals that are going through these particular situations. Um, and that starts with doing some of the research to then get into exactly what you're going to say, right? So understanding, providing the data to make sure that everybody has access to that particular data to make those informed policy decisions that will inevitably take time to be fully implemented. But again, we have to start somewhere. And uh, I really do appreciate the, the research that you're doing on this background because it's uh, immensely important um, to as we move forward, not only as, uh, not only in America, but uh, in fact, everywhere across the world. So I'll pass it over to Mania about uh, your hardest part of the project. Oh, wait, was it next steps or? Yeah, what is next uh, for you? Next steps, right, yeah. Um, so I'm pursuing a major in psych. I hope to switch it to something more, um, what more with a concentration in, in neuroscience though, um, once I at college. Um, but I hope to get involved in nonprofits and uh, also research uh, labs where that tackle like similar issues um, might not be the exact same thing that I researched, but something similar that connects um, mental disorders and parts of the brain and just exploring different aspects to that because it's a really big field and the prevalence of mental health disorders are, is just increasing um, in society today. So I hope to do something that'll address that issue. Yeah, that's that's great. And I mean, um, something that has been a common thread throughout the past couple of years, if not the past five years, is the the prevalence of like mental health apps. So you can also do both, right? A proactive approach to this particular situation or work with uh, like a reactive approach because of those that have already entered into this kind of realm um, and coupling both together so that for those in the future working on that proactive approach, but making sure that um, we're focusing on those in these particular situations currently and helping them uh, get access, resources, anything that they possibly can um, to move uh, forward in the in the best possible light and uh, I think that's that's awesome. And then I will pass it over to Kyle for his next steps. Um, yeah, my next steps for this project is kind of um, sending it over to different um, journals and publication websites. So my research can be kind of shared towards the entire public audience. I recently only just finished it, so. I still have to get on that um, kind of sending in my work and things like that. But also like my big dream is kind of just sending it to like different state governments and things like that, if that's even possible and maybe having them take a look at it and maybe maybe take it into consideration when legislation gets passed and things like that, whatnot. And in the future, I kind of want to go in this direction like policy and understand that economics is really important in today's society, like money gets around, things like that. So it like kind of also attaining knowledge in economics as well would kind of be a good approach and kind of is hinted through my project incorporating both um, factors of economics and public policy. Yeah, and that's great. And I think there's somewhat of a theme for a couple um, on this, uh, on these presentations, they're not exactly intersected, but there's a lot of overlap between a number of your all's presentations. Uh, so wanted to mention that I would absolutely reach out to each other for support, help, questions, comments in the future. Um, it's something that uh, we try to continue to do as we move forward is creating this polygens network of uh, peers that you can um, build 
over time. And I think that um, all of these pieces are really, really important. Um, sometimes slightly different, sometimes almost exactly the same, but I feel like everybody can benefit from each other. Um, but thank you there. And then uh, I believe I'm going to pass it over to Talia for her next steps. Um, so I think the next steps are just further distribu distribution. Um, the book is on Amazon, but my goal is to distribute it even more by having it be part of the elementary school curriculum. Um, right now it's being taught at two elementary schools in Canada, and I hope to reach out to more schools so the future generation can really grasp the idea of deliberative democracy. Absolutely. That's wonderful. So do you anticipate uh, another type of path is to go into the education of individuals for this specific topic of some some sort of professorship teaching um, in elementary schools? Um, or would that be more so the education of those educators to provide the necessary tools so that they can deliver those um, to others or a little bit of both? Yeah, definitely um, a little bit of both. I hope that like right now, as I'm still going through like my own education, the generation right now can grasp it until like I have my um, further education and even potentially going into like a career in politics so I can utilize it and be like a real world example. Awesome. That's great. And we have about um, six minutes left here. So the last question that I wanted to pose to everybody and we'll go around in the same order is um, obviously you had a interest to some extent, whether that be um, you were already working on this particular topic, um, you were kind of delving a little bit deeper into this topic or it was new um, and you wanted to learn a lot more about it but I wanted to hear some advice that you would give to another potential student uh, just starting on this particular research topic. And I can pass it over to Krishna uh, to start us off here. I'm sorry, just to clarify the question. So another student that's getting onto my specific topic? Yep, yep, exactly. Okay. Uh, relative to the, each individual here, what would you encourage someone um, who's going to enter into that particular topic? Sure. Yeah. So I would encourage them to be going into this with an optimistic mindset, really, because the industry that, you know, we're looking at when we're talking about fuel and everything, the current state of it is, while it is developing towards a better um, outlook, it's not really where it should be, right? So we definitely need to be optimists in this field and be able to think about what can be done, but also remember that you know, realistically, there's still a lot that needs to be done, right? So you need to have that kind of balance. But also, it's very important to not let the the negative parts of all of this, um, all of the situation of the well, global, global situation of fuel and everything get to you when you're really researching into this, because without able researchers and, you know, develop, uh, like a good amount of development in this field, progress will be very difficult to make. So that's something I would um, probably highlight. Awesome. That's that's definitely very helpful. And I think that the research isn't always easy and messy, but that's what makes it beautiful is kind of the thread there. Um, but I'll pass it over to Rojo for um, any advice that he has. Uh, yeah, so for anyone that's really kind of considering going into a field like this, I think really the main thing is just to kind of have compassion, because when you're working with some of these people in nursing homes or hospitals or wherever, somewhere in the medical field, a lot of these people, they have like unforeseen circumstances that you can't see, um, kind of either disorders, diseases, um, and so just kind of working with compassion uh, and just trying to make the world a better place, as cliche as it sounds, that that's really, really important. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's really going to take the field far if you're able to do things like that. So, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's the common theme, um, just getting the access and, and, and having that compassion for those individuals. And don't forget, self-compassion 
It's not a failure if you didn't get the conclusion that you expected. It's just a generation of additional questions or knowing what the answer isn't. Um, so I'll pass it over to uh, Claire uh, to talk about um, any advice that she has for um, future students. Um, my advice to future students going into my same subject is to definitely keep it like an open mind and an open heart, especially when dealing with heavier topics. I think that's really important. Um, also questioning things that we have learned in history class and knowing that there's different perspectives um, and that history is often told by the victor. And so um, just keeping your mind open to things and reevaluating things that you've learned, I think is also very important. Um, since sources are very scarce in my particular subject, I think um, being willing to spend hours hunting for information that is correct and true and factual is also really important. Absolutely. And I think that two things there, right? Like challenging the status quo, questioning those particular pieces is always moving us in a positive direction. So thanks, Claire. Uh, and then I'll send it over to Manya for uh, the advice here. Uh, so if someone was going in at what I researched, I'd recommend to not get discouraged. I believe that a few points uh, or throughout like the six to eight months that this project took, um, I, I, I lost motivation to continue finding research papers because I felt like I was getting nowhere and I kept having to adjust my topic around. And I believe that if you truly look hard enough there, you'll find something out there. And for some topics, it's harder than others. And neuro in neuroscience topics, like it's easy to find conflicting papers that may yield different results. And I found a few that did that and it was really tough to narrow it down and what I wanted to choose. So I, I just say, keep an open mind and don't lose motivation. And if you really love something, just keep an open mind and continue to do it. And cause you will be proud of yourself at the end. Great, yeah. And so that's another thread, right? Getting over those obstacles are gonna be something that you take with forever. And then you're going to be able to give yourself a self-compassion if you run into this issue in the future. And it's a really powerful message. Um, and I'll send it over to Kyle for um, any advice. Um, yeah, some advice for from my end is um, kind of um, just knowing why you're doing it and kind of look, look um, I think Professor Pewitt was talking about in his keynote speech, um, kind of just looking deep into like your past and who you are now and just seeing like, what I, like kind of the why you're doing it aspect because some of my work it, my work kind of did get monotonous and it's just like writing and reading and typing like for days on end it just gets like pretty boring I'm not gonna lie and drink I've drank like a lot of coffee and just focusing on this but kind of what centered me and kind of like what drove me forward is kind of just understanding why I'm doing it and also reading the news just staying up to date on legislation, things like that, just a side note, but, but the most important part is just knowing why you're doing it. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I definitely agree with that. And it's, um, it's just something that we have to go through. Um, but again, finding that light at the end of the tunnel, it makes it all, all worth it. Um, so I'll pass it over to Talia about any advice and then finish with Anton and then we'll close out. Um, so I think I would advise them not to let age be a factor to hold you back because everyone here is like so young and we're so able to exhibit what we're passionate about and for deliberative democracy in particular, since it's a relatively new concept, don't be afraid to reach out to others um, who have experience for help and gain like mentorship. Um, especially when drafting a book, it never has to be the final product. You can always revise until you're content with what you have. Absolutely. And I think that's a, a good message here, right? So um, oftentimes uh, just asking the question to someone is kind of the biggest obstacle, but I'm sure you will find over the next couple of years that people are more willing to help you than you think. So asking the question is the hardest thing, but it's sometimes getting the action to do that is the most important. 
And uh, I'll pass it over to Anton to close this out and then give some final remarks. All right. Um, I guess the advice I would give is just be patient. Uh, the research is always changing. New things are always coming out, uh, especially in my topic. So yeah, be patient, keep learning more, and eventually you'll be able to figure it all out. Awesome. Thank you all for the amazing presentations here. Uh, I learned a lot and I really do hope to continue to follow the, the research as you all continue to move forward. Just remember, ask the questions. Don't think that you're less than anything that you are. Um, ask, ask for help. It's okay. We're not going to have all of the answers. Keep moving forward. Um, and I really do love what each and every one of you are doing. Um, so keep your head up. And thanks again for the presentations. They were amazing. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.